Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the third in the series of podcasts for The Lunch Club. And my guest today is, well, I mean, where do you begin with Freddie Davies, a star not just of stage and screen, but, but just a beautiful soul. Freddie, it is a pleasure to have you on the show. And I want to kick off, actually, with an unlikely moment in your career, which is the advert you did for McDonald's. Good heavens, yes. Yeah, that was out of the blue. And that was purely from, any, I know there's uh, plenty of actors uh, listening, um, that was that was purely from a self-tape, would you believe? You're kidding. It was, for, it was for France. And I was about to go down for it, down to London for the audition, because I'm in North Yorkshire. I was about to go down for it, and the casting director said, no, 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 don't come down. Just do a little self-tape. It'll be all right. She said, I think we're all London-based anyway, and that was it. Amazing. So I did this self-tape and sent it in, and they came back and said, we don't want anybody else. Oh. Well, I can see why, because, it, you know, if you haven't seen the ad, uh, and I watched it researching um, researching your career, you have the most beautiful, warm, wise, funny face anyway. You're not talking about me. <laughs> stop it, stop it. But you do. And in this particular show, uh, or advert even, it, it feels like a, a, a movie. It has that sensibility. I can feel the hinterland of your character. Uh, it, it's incredibly tender. It's really sweet. And okay. I never thought I'd say that about an ad. And I think only you could deliver something so truthful and real and communicative. And really, I want to get to the nub of where that comes from. Has that always been the case with you? Have you always had that ability to just bring characters to life and reach into an audience's heart? Well, I, I think you do it unconsciously. Um, they always say that comics make good actors, but it doesn't necessarily happen the other way around. And I'm, I'm not sure whether that's sort of sort of like a lifelong training, really. I think to be a comic or a stand-up comedian, you do have to have a lot of, you know, gall, really, to stand up there and make them have it, particularly on difficult nights. And um, I do think you learn something, because you are actually doing an act, you know, as a comic. Very few comics are um, truthful. What I mean by truthful, I mean that what you see is what you get. You know, and... A perfect example, of course, is Bradley Walsh. Yeah. Actually, what you see is what you get. He really is a very truthful, normal, natural performer, comic. And uh, I think that's what comes across, and that's really the key to his success. But like, going back to comics generally, comedians generally, um, you know, having to put on this act, I think you have to be have a little pathos in you as well. Uh, well, I think so, anyway. And... Um, I've always found that when I've, when I, you know, really most actors don't drift too far away from what they are. I don't think so in real terms. I think that if they feel they can do it, they, they will, they will have, if they feel it's within them. Um, but you see, I'm an untrained actor. I didn't do drama school. I didn't come up that way at all. I don't have that kind of discipline. Although I do have a discipline. You have to have a discipline for which, whichever. Um, you, you're doing, you know, whether it's you know stage or television or film, it's a certain discipline. I think you have to acquire. So if it's something, I agree with you about the pathos because I think without that, then it can be comedy can be you know without it can lack dimension and depth. And I think that's without harking on about McDonald's, there are other burgers available. I think that's what comes across beautifully in your performance in that. And I'm wondering, is that part of the discipline? Do you have to? Does that? When you're performing, does that come to you, or do you rehearse that, or do you work on it, or do you look into a mirror? How? What's your process for that? Well, I don't. I I can't rehearse. Well, no, that's, that's wrong to say. I can't rehearse. I do rehearse because I have to rehearse if I'm doing working with other people. But comics generally, comedians, stand-up comics, don't rehearse because in order to rehearse, you have to have an audience, and unless you have an audience, it's very difficult. And well, I have never stood in front of a mirror and done anything. The only time I ever really, really looked in a mirror was when the Parrot Face character was pointed out to me <laughs> that it was a good face and a head. And I looked at it um, objectively and I thought, yeah, this would be a good television head. And that was the only time I've ever really looked at myself in a mirror. Um, other than having a shave, of course. <laughs> yeah, I'd hope so. Um, but the the list of the people that you have either worked with or been friends with is is exceptional. I mean, you've you've got Ronnie Corbett, Dave Allen, Oliver Platt, Lee Evans, Richard Griffiths, Oliver Reed, and so on. And 
you stood among them and given extraordinary performances. I'm just wondering, among those, among that sort of pantheon of, of stars, are there one or two that stand out that you learn something from or that you exchange something with? Or, or you learn something all the time. You learn all the time. I mean, when you work with these guys, people like Richard Griffiths, I mean, he really had a lot to give. He, he has... Um, uh, um, but partic- I tell you, I particularly learned something from was was Jerry Lewis. Oh, really? It was a it was a very very fine actor. A lot of people don't realise what good actor he was. And actually, working opposite him, you could you could sort of um, feel his. Uh, I don't know what it is. Feel, a feel his vibes and at, attach yourself to that to that um, uh, attitude that they have. These good film actors and. You do learn something every day, particularly in this profession. You never stop learning, even if it's what not to do. Yeah, so it, so with Jerry, it was Funny Bones, which is, you know, the iconic yeah. uh, movie. Uh, how did that come about, actually? Was that something... Well, it was a Peter Chelsom film. Chels- Peter Chelsom um, did his first show uh, with me, a little pantomime called Cinderella, down in Ipswich when he was a young lad. And he was sort of ASM and... You know, shoveling after shoveling up after the horses, etc. <laughs> <laughs> and but he got his equity card, and then he went on to do work, and I think he went to Central School, and he became quite a good actor. Worked at the National, etc. But he really wanted to be a film director. We kept in touch over the years, and he put me in his first film, which was a um, a little twenty minute, no, not eleven minute uh, film called Treacle about Blackpool, apparently it's on YouTube and it's well worth a look. It was his, his first directorial feat. And from that, he got the finance to do Hear My Song. And after Hear My Song, he got the, after several years, he got the money to do Funny Bones. Now, Funny Bones was a story, original story, about my granddad, which he'd heard backstage when he was doing the panto. And my granddad used to do a paper slap act, slapstick act, so this with is my Jack, grandmother. Where he, Jack Herbert, Yes, he it? used to... Jack Herbert, my granddad. And uh, he'd heard these old pro stories and and wanted to put them into some kind of film. But anyway, my granddad used to do his paper slap routine. So he asked me, could he make it into a drama? Which he did. And he brought in a drama writer who was... Um, who escapes me at the moment? Anyway, I will re- I will remember remember his name. His name is no man. He wrote our th- our friends in the north. Yes, yeah, so Peter Flannery his name was. Yeah, and he wrote the dramatic side of the film, and 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 put in all the all the drama to it. Uh, but Peter had a, had a huge impact um, on the script. Of course, it was his final draft, I believe. So- Anyway, he made the comedy of my grandfather's act into a tragedy, whereby the guy gets beaten to death with a fellow with a rolled-up newspaper, but there was an iron bar inside it, and that was that was the that was a pretext for the film. It's extraordinary they're going through all of your various disciplines because it's it's quite actually quite tough to sort of pin your career down because you're a comic, you've written Funny Bones, My Life in Comedy, your book, you've directed. Panto, you've appeared in Panto, you've produced, I think, Cinderella at Leicester de Montfort Hall. Uh, what for you? I mean, how, how does how does how do you look back at your career? I mean, is it is it for you just a seamless representation of you and your abilities, or did you feel yourself consciously jumping from disciplines? No, I think I was sort of reinventing myself each time. I mean, after twenty years of doing the parrot face thing, I mean, I just felt that it was on the way, and I mean, and it was without a shadow of a doubt. So in the early 80s, I sort of drifted into other things. I mean, I drifted into this production company in London where the uh, the, the, the guy who owned it, a fellow called Bunny Barron, sadly passed away and left a widow who didn't quite not know what to do with the company because it had five little pantos and five little summer shows on the South Coast. And she asked me just... Uh, I was doing a season for them uh, and for the company when Bunny died. And she, and she said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, well, look, why don't I come in a couple of days and see if I can help you a little bit. I know everybody in the business, so why not? So that's how it started. And the two days became 
seven days in a week. I, let, I stayed for two years. And then I sort of moved out on my own as a producer. I was still working, still doing one-nighters and weeks and stuff. I never gave up doing my stand-up, but I just sort of drifted into these other things as well, which I enjoyed very much. So in terms of the business, how do you feel about the way things have changed uh, during your career? Well, they do change. Everything changes, of course. Um, comedy particularly has changed since the 80s. It all became stand-up. Stand-up comics used to be called front cloth comics because you had to stand in front of a cloth and do your act while they were changing behind. Mm. And that's that's where the term comes from. Always called front cloth comics or review comics. Yeah, They'd, they'd put these reviews out and there, there would be a comic. The review comic then did sketches in the show. Uh, comedy, comedic sketches, and so you say, "Oh, he's a great sketch comic," or "He's a great review comic," and that's what that's what they meant, of course. So, stand-up, as we know it today, uh, with the, really came from from the student union, and uh, and and that's why a lot of the oldens don't like it. I think because it is a lot of it is, with respect, student humour. A lot of it isn't, of course, but. But I would say that's where it started, you know, in in uh, colleges and unis, uh, and uh, came out to the fore, so to speak. There's some, I mean, some of the alternatives, are, what they call alternatives, are great, you know, Lee Evans, to, to, to quote just one, you know, Stu Francis and Lee Mack, um, Peter Kay. You know, they all came out from, you know, from the 80s, 90s onwards. Yeah. Well, it brings me neatly, actually, to our first question from a Lunch Club member. Sylvan Mason would like to ask uh, who your favourite comedian is or was. I mean, can you pick just one? Oh, well, well, it's very difficult to pick just one. There's so many who, who actually did and do make me laugh still. I mean, Ken Dodd was really was the master. You know, to watch Ken working, you know, he was the ultimate of... of you know, what what we all hope to be, a great stand-up comedy. You could stand on the stage for hours and just just keep the audience rolling with laughter. He had a wonderful rhythm to his performance, mm. a great rhythm, you know. Mrs, it's me, I've got the tickling stick, and it was just, he worked with a, just a tremendous rhythm, which, of course, he, he could keep going because he was paying, playing to packed audiences all the time, and it's always easier to make a full audience laughed and it is to make five or six people very true and and thinking actually of all those names who cut their teeth you know traveling around the country i'm thinking of you know yourself ronnie corbett and you know dave allen i remember hearing an interview with you where you were discussing how he was a very frenetic comedian as a younger man and went to australia and came back with his more avuncular style and you must have seen people go from playing albeit packed houses you know venues and then suddenly they're on the box, you know, like yourself, and they're, they're, they're stars. And can you just talk us through a little bit that, that transition? Because to us, it just seems like you pop up on the box, you're a massive star, and there it is. But the transition must be more gradual. It must feel different to that. But you mean personally? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's weird. I, I think when you start, well, for me personally, all I wanted to do was earn a good living in the business. Mm. You know, a bit like my granddad, really. I never. You don't think about, oh, if it would be marvellous if I were a star. Yes, it would be. But so few people hit that top that you can't really contemplate it. You really, you know, think in terms of earning a good living at it. You know, making a good living and, do, and doing well at what you do. So when the chance of, you know, what they laughingly call stardom, and there are, there are several things that um, I hate about the word, you know, Star means different things to different people. You know, to the general public, a star is somebody who they love. You know, so oh, I love him or I love her. You know, but in real terms, a star is somebody who actually brings people into a theatre. Yes. So they they do two things. People love them and they're a draw also. But they don't have to be a draw in the theatre to be loved. Yes. See what I mean? Yeah, I so, do. So that... Yeah, the, you know, that's a that's a, a great truism, I feel. I mean, somebody who crosses that barrier, of course, is like Ken Dodd, or people like Max Bygraves um, cross that divide because he was a huge draw in the theatre. Absolutely huge draw, and he had a wonderful, laid-back, 
attitude and comedic attitude. He was first and foremost a comedian, mm. although he made lots of records, of course. But he, as I say, was first and foremost a comic, and and a great comic too as well. He was just excellent. But to travel the distance, but, uh, sorry, go on. Sorry, you were saying. Oh, I was just going to ask to travel the distance and go from being a great comic to being, you know, a star. We'll, we'll use the word, even though it's, you know, uh, no, it's it's one of those things that I, I just think it involves so much hard work, and that's one of the things that I always have huge respect for people in the business for. It doesn't just happen overnight, and I think it's all too easy for people at home to sit and think, oh, it's all just fallen into the lap of this person. But take you yourself, you know, there are years and years of cutting your teeth, you know, honing your craft. You know, becoming, you know, in a position professionally to be able to deliver. Uh, can you just expand a little bit on on your work ethic, actually, and, and the drive and, and the consistency? Well, yeah, I mean, in the beginning, when you first start, I mean, I started out in amateur dramatics uh, and doing a bit of a bit of an act. I used to do my granddad's act, of course, which was much too old for me to do <laughs> when I was a kid. I'm talking about, you know, 14, 15, 16 and then I would do a lot of amateur dramatics. But I always felt at home on the stage, I have to say that. I did I did feel as if I I ought to be there. Uh, and so when I went into the army, I started working the working men's clubs up around Newcastle upon Tyne, and they were tough, believe me. They were mm. very tough. So tough, in fact, that instead of doing a gag to open with, I used to do a magic trick, oh, yeah. a little sleight of hand thing. What was that just one? To get get me over that barrier, you know. What was the trick? Did you uh, do something specific? Well, it just... was, yes, it was with um, with three small billiard balls <laughs> where I would uh, <laughs> appear and disappear them. Oh. And I'd maybe, I'd maybe drop one and look at the audience and say, I think I've dropped one. <laughs> 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 and then pick it up. But it would get me over that yeah. that first barrier, you know, of getting on the stage, which is which is an awful thing because that, that's where the nerves kick in, your first your first moment on the stage. You see, if you don't show confidence to an audience, they won't have confidence in you. Right. So you have to have that confidence when you first go on. That's where the goal comes from, having the goal to do it. Yeah. And I have, but a, anyway. I have a, another question here talking of, of firsts from Michael Littman from The Lunch Club, uh, who asks, when Freddie put the hat on and Raspberry talked for the first time, what was the response? And did he instantly see it as something that could be the basis for a hugely successful act? No, I didn't at first. That's the thing about looking in the mirror. I didn't. It was just one gag that I told in a northern club on a very quiet midweek night at a club called the Northern Sporting Club in Manchester, which was a huge ex odeon cinema, absolutely huge. Held 2,000 people at the weekend, absolutely huge. They had gambling on the side, and part of the criteria for having a gambling licence was that you had to have cabaret mm -hmm. and a band and dancing so you had to supply all those things so the clubs that's why the clubs had to employ acts so they would they would employ acts for the week two or three acts and you would do you do your act weekend there would be plenty of business friday and saturday and sunday rest of the week very quiet so it's a quiet sort of wednesday tuesday night in manchester and i was chatting away to these few tables in the front of the stage, and I used to do a thing where you give me a subject, I'll tell you a joke about it. It's an old trick, and you just twist it round to the joke you're going to tell anyway, you know. Because yeah. they always come up with some obscure thing. But this woman, this particular night, said, tell us a joke about a budgie. So, thinking quick on my feet, and I always had this hat as a prop, um, not for any other reason than I used to, it was a Homburg and it would twist into various things and I could do lots of silly things with it. Uh, and so I stuck it down, pulled it over my ears or down to my ears and made the joke two characters because it was about a fella going in a pet shop and complaining about a budgie that he'd been sold the previous <laughs> week. So I took the hat off and then the guy behind the counter was the guy without the hat. So it developed this little character. Anyway, it went very well, but I hadn't thought about the the character aspect of it and I used to I continued to do the gag because it was a good gag and it was you know it was it worked very well and this pal of mine came to uh, came to see me one evening and he said I just uh, have you seen this fella the character you do with the hat on <laughs> and I said no he said I didn't think so you should have a look at that in the mirror and that's when I got home that night I looked at him in the mirror and I thought yes this would make a good talking head yeah good television head which is what television is all about and uh, so I I persevered with it, and I really 
made the character work more. You know, it gave him more effect, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, did eyes and teeth and things. <laughs> and that, that's how yeah. he was born. <laughs> and it served you very well. Um, Charles Marriott would like to know, um, being a comic, obviously, did you, did you set out to be an actor... And would you have liked to have been an actor, for example, doing Shakespeare? Or is comedy always the thing that has uh, has guided you? I never, ever wanted to do anything other than be a comic. Mm -hmm. That was my whole modus operandi. I wanted to be a stand-up comic. That's all I ever wanted to do. I didn't know how I was going to do it because I just didn't know of a way in. I mean, when I was started, you know, in the 50s, 56, 57, when I came out of the army, 58. I just didn't know what to do. Didn't know how to get in the business. I know my granddad had been in, but he was in a different business. Mm -hmm. He was in in the 30s and 40s when they used to send him a telegram on a Saturday and saying, are you free next week? And they would book them. That's how he used to get his work, literally. Yeah. And they put a thing in the performer or the stage saying, free the week of October the 3rd. November the 8th, and free for Panto. Yeah. And that's how they used to get the work. Anyway, now I never ever wanted to do anything but comedy. So how was I going to do it? So whilst I was in the army in Newcastle, I used to go to the local empire every week, the Newcastle Empire, where which was a number one theatre run, and they used to have a lot of American stars. And one week they had the Billy Cotton Band Show, and the comic as part of the band show was Des O'Connor. Oh, yeah. By 1957, of course, he was a young, modern stand-up comic. Yeah. Exactly what I wanted to be. So I collared him outside the stage door and I said, oh, I really want to do what you do. And I'm in the army at the moment. Do you know any advice? And he said, yes, go to Butlins, be a redcoat. Yeah. So I, I took his advice to the letter. I told him many years later what I'd done, because he didn't remember me, of course. But um, I did a lot of work with Des. So I... I applied for a job, but as soon as I came out of the army, uh, which was January 58, I applied to become a redcoat, and I got the job. And I stayed for six years, and that, I consider, was my apprenticeship. Yeah, I mean, it's a... That was, that was my stage school. Because it's, it's constant, isn't it? I mean, you've got to turn so many shows, you've got to keep the energy up, you've got to hone your act. It's, it's yeah, six years well spent. So was that audition, was that the Queen's Hotel Manchester? Yeah, See, but it's no longer there. But that's where they, that's where I was auditioned, and they would have five of the entertainment managers. There were only five camps in those days, and they had the five entertainment managers, and they had this folder in front of them <laughs> with your details on it. Oh, no. And as they lost interest in you, they would <laughs> close the folder. I didn't know this till many years later, but one folder remained open from a woman called, man called Frank Mansell, who became my first mentor. Let this go past. God, there's a lot of traffic today. Popular? Not usually as bad as this. No, don't anyway. Worry. Yes, Frank Mansell was my first mentor and he gave me my first job. At the audition, I did a little magic show with my billiard balls and thimbles and cigarettes, which I was quite adept at. I mean, I'm not as, very, I'm not as good now. I mean, I can still do it to a fashion, but I'm not as good now. But I'm in magic clubs and, and things and I'm, I still like magic. And I know an awful lot of magicians. But um, uh, as I say, I did this magic act. And in my first season, they put me in the Red Coat show doing a Chinese magic act. Um, and made a costume for me and I did a Chinese magic act. I didn't tell any jokes at all. So jokes came later, but what a journey that took you on, because suddenly you're doing stand-up on the Tom Jones show, Sunday night at the London Palladium, and how did that sudden... Was that a jump, or did it happen gradually? Well, it was weird, really. I mean, you don't plan for it, because you can't plan for it. You don't know what's going to happen in the future. But I did Opportunity Knox, and that was it. Uh, I had 22 million viewers, and I started to get other TV shows, and I had to get writers... Um, and, and so it moved on. I mean, you don't realise at the time that, 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 that you can't realise that there's 22 billion people watching, otherwise it would frighten you to death. <laughs> so you just have to imagine it's maybe just one or two people or the audience there, you know. But it's um, you, you do these things. I mean, it's what you do. It's uh, I accepted it. I accepted that, it, that the character was becoming popular, 
and um, and got on with it, so to speak. I mean, at the time, you, you, one is so busy doing it, not having any free time, that you just you just do it. It's what you do. Yeah, and it's led to. I know. I know it sounds a bit glib, but it is. <laughs> when I look back on it, it's it's exactly it's, it's exactly the way it happens. You can't plan it. You know, you just have to. Go with the flow, as I say. Well, and going with the flow, I bet you never imagined you'd appear in, in the Harry Potter movies. I mean, that's you're one of the portraits, aren't you? No, that came out of the blue, yes. That came out of the blue. It wasn't the original part I went up for. I went up for the um, the owner of the, the shop, in, you know, in that wonky lane. Oh, yes, and, um, yes. The way they did... The way they, the way, the way they did... Auto, that's right. The way they did... Auto, uh, um, uh, interviews yeah. for that for harry potter it was so they would get you down and they would make a costume for you there and then mm. put you in a costume and film you doing it there was no messing about and it was wonderful anyway they they didn't quite like what they saw obviously mm. not but the the director alfonso queron yeah. who was a huge fan of funny bones said don't worry frederick i still will have you in the film and he made me a talking picture Yes. <laughs> and, and that's how I came to be in it. So I have a question here yeah, from it was, it Steve. Was great. Um, Wonderful experience to oh, be in. Yeah, I bet. It must have been uh, no extraordinary. And I, I actually, it kind of leads on to this question from Steve Blackman uh, from the Lunch Club. Is there a role that Freddie would still love to play if given the opportunity? Yes. Um, there, are, there are a couple of things I want to do, I'd love to do. One is the Sunshine Boys. Mm. Um, I'd love to play, uh, I've loved to play the old character in the Sunshine Boys and Willie. And um, I, I've nearly done it about five times. I've had five scripts sent to me to do it. It's something always got in the way. I was going to do a production with Maureen Lipman directing in Edinburgh. And then Jimmy Logan became available, so Jimmy did it. Anyway, things like that. And I wanted to... I had all lined up to do a tour with Tom Owen, you know, Bill, Bill yes. Owen's son. Yeah, yeah. We wanted to do the tour of it, and we, we inquired whether we could do it, and yes, we could. And then this corona thing descended on us. Yeah. So that's all been put on the back burner. But I'd love to do the Sunshine Boys. And funnily enough, I'd like to be in Emmerdale. Yes, I know that sounds like a bit of a stretch, but living it, living in North Yorkshire, I think I'd, uh, I'd make a great granddad. Oh yeah, in, uh, <laughs> in Emmerdale. I, I can totally but, see. But um, I, I, I meant to be doing a series with Amanda Redman called Bumps, uh -huh. which uh, which was piloted last year. Oh and, yes, uh, it's mooted that it's going to be a series, but. Yeah, that's the. Is Until that about, all this um, gets, all, gets about, done with, I, I suppose. Yeah, is that about Amanda having a baby at a, at an older age? Yes, correct. Yes, I think we had her on on the show. Yeah. I was I was also doing. And she spoke of it. Yeah. Well, I hope that happens. It sounded brilliant. Yeah, I was playing her dad. Ah. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, her how, father how, in it. How, so, how, um, you know, you mentioned the the pandemic and this situation. How, how are you coping? I think that our profession, the theatre profession, is probably going to be hardest hit. Yeah. Because of all the jobs, you you need a crowd to entertain, and crowds are going to be the last thing to get together. Yeah, I, I know. I think the, uh, the 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 difficulty facing theatre closures is really chilling, but we can only hope that um, we manage to find a way through and that people still have the will. To, uh, to support our great arts. Um, but across the board, I think what really impresses me, Freddie, about your world and your life and career is just the breadth of it all. I mean, you're so lucky. A song written, I believe, with Peter Salas, was it? Was It was a massive hit in South America and the Philippines. I mean, can you talk us through that? It just sounds, in amongst all this, we've talked about I know, production, weird. direction. Well, no, it wasn't comments. Peter Salas. It was actually oh, Bill Owen. Oh, sorry, Bill Owen. I beg your pardon. Yeah, I was problem. on the right lines last of the summer yeah, absolutely. wine. Absolutely. And my yeah. apologies. Bill Owen, quite right. No, no. Um, Bill, dear Bill, um, uh, well, I was doing the summer season in Great Yarmouth, 1971. 1970, no, 71, and an act on the bill was called New World, and they were an Australian act that had recently won Opportunity Knox. Anyway, they're they're uh, on the bill, and the the manager of the group was a, a chap called John Grossman, 
mm-hmm. and he said to me, he was a, in the record industry, and he said, have you ever thought of doing a straight song? I said, no. He said, well, let me see if I can find something for you. And he came up to my home in Blackpool, where I was then living, and he brought several record, several demos for me to listen to, and the one that stuck out by a mile was so lucky. Mm-hmm. It had English lyrics by Bill Owen, it was an Italian ballad, and I thought I, it was a stretch for me, but I thought I could just about do this. So we paid for it ourselves, John Grossman, myself, and my agent, Mike Hughes, and we put £270 each into the kitty and made this rather nice recording called So Lucky, which didn't do terribly well in Britain, sales-wise. Got some lots of plays, but didn't actually do that well. But then, for some unknown reason, it became a hit in Brazil and the Philippines. <laughs> well, I say it's some unknown reason. I actually know how it happened. It's because it was a, it was a combo, it was on a combo album, combination <sighs> album, where, and it was the first track, and that was the track that was played, and that's why it became a hit. But it, it, they then released it as a sign, uh, a single out there. And I actually got a gold record for Brazil, would you believe? No way. I can't read it. It's in Portuguese. <laughs> but I, I believe it said, <laughs> for the record, <laughs> for the recording of So Lucky, I have it on my mantelpiece. Oh, it's just lovely. I mean, it must be, you know, an, an extraordinary time. You know, here we are. We're all at home, you know, looking forward to uh, being able to work again and see the ones we love. But looking back, I mean, just to um, to finish off, it, it, there must be so many gems from your career that you look on with great fondness. Is there one one that particularly stands out? Well, I hadn't I hadn't thought about my career at all until I wrote the book. Yeah. And when I started putting the book together, I'd realised over the years this, the amount of stuff that I'd done, and it was just, just mind mind blowing. And now when people mention it like your good self, and I think to myself, I, don't, I really don't believe I did all that. Yeah. But uh, I did do, you know, it's, it's, it's your life. And until you get to my age, which is, you know, I'm just over the age of, of 80, uh, and you look back on it, you realise, you know, what, you, what you've gone through and been through. Uh, what stands out in my life, I suppose? Well, when I went over to America... Uh, to do some shows in Orlando, I, I thought it didn't pan out very well. So I got a job on a cruise ship when I was out there. And I stayed for four years on this cruise ship. Oh. Not on the same one, it, it, different cruise ships in the same same shipping line. But uh, I liked it and I became a cruise director, would you believe? Amazing. I wasn't known in America at all, so I was just another act, which was uh, which I found uh, good and interesting to do, much better. Uh, and uh, I stayed for four years. So, but when I came back, I think that I came back in ninety one, and I started to then to do more straight roles, because Funny Bones was on the horizon. Funny Bones didn't actually happen till nineteen ninety four. It was written in 1986, would you believe? Wow. And it was bought by Working Title, and they didn't do anything with it. And then Disney took an interest in it uh, in 93, and uh, it was purchased back from Working Title and became a a, a Disney film. But uh, So I, I would say coming back to Britain, um, the UK in 91, 92, that's when I really started to to become more of an actor, mm-hmm. and I still did stand up, but that had sort of gone onto a back burner. But I was, and I started getting more more straight acting roles, and I, I must admit I enjoyed it. It was a different side to the business for me, but I really enjoyed it. We have said that was a that was a, I suppose that turning point, coming back from the states and settling back over after four years away. And and really, just really moving into being um, more more of a straight actor. Yeah. Well, we've all that that was that was that was that was a, that was a conscious move. So so that was something you decided. You know what? I'm I'm going to shift over, and this is the side I'm now up for. Yes. Um, it be, it became it became. I wasn't calling myself so much a stand up 
uh, as being a you know a performer and I, and I think I became more more known as a as an actor then as albeit people would call me a comedy actor but um, most of the roles I had were quite straight yeah as soon as I take the hat off of course I I was a straight actor well this is the thing I mean to come to come back where we started to end where we began with the the commercial for the for the burgers, I just urge anyone who wants to feel warm at this time to to watch it. You know, ignore the fact it's an ad and just revel in the marvel of Freddie Davies. Freddie, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute joy and a pleasure.